Today on Coffee Break Tennis, we have one of the thickest stacks of tennis news we've ever had on the show before. We get like 20 pages, six or seven draws in there because, as Tennis Channel likes to say, we are in the middle of frantic February. And that could be a bit overwhelming for you, the tennis fan, because we just made it through jubilant January where we had the kickoff of the 2020 tennis season and, of course, the Australian Open. And if we survive frantic Februar, we will go straight into Masterful March, where we kick off Masters 1000 ATP tournaments at Indian Wells, Miami, the Sunshine Double, one of the most exciting times of the year. And don't get me started on Amazing April, where this sport tennis does something amazing you don't see in other sports. They completely change it up and go from hard courts to clay, almost being a new sport in itself with such a change in the conditions of play. And we are here, Coffee Break Tennis, to talk about all of it today. That's why we have a super packed show with so much stuff to talk about. And the thing about Frantic February is, you might not see Rafa, you might not see Djokovic, sometimes we see Roger. This year will be one of those occasions. We see Roger next week in Dubai. <laughs> Breaking news, Roger Federer will not be playing in Dubai next week, as was said in this video. This video was filmed last night after uh, uh, after the conclusion of play, most of the play that happened yesterday. And uh, Roger Federer, it turned out, the news broke this morning around 6 a.m., is going to have surgery on his right knee. This is what Roger Federer said. My right knee has been bothering me for a little while. I hoped it would go away, but after an examination and discussion with my team, I decided to have arthroscopic surgery in Switzerland yesterday, which this, that's where they have the best if you, if you want to have surgery. Uh, Switzerland's the best place, so rest assured, Federer fans. <laughs> After the procedure, the doctors confirmed that it was the right thing to have done and are very confident of a full recovery. As a result, I will have to miss five tournaments. Federer continues. Here they are. Dubai, Indian Wells, Bogota, Miami, and, of course, the French Open. I'm grateful for everyone's support. I can't wait to be back playing again soon. See you on grass. Uh, I have heard that Roger will make his return on uh, Halle, Halle, Germany, where uh, the, what is it, ATP 500, where he always plays right before Wimbledon, and then he will play Wimbledon. This is, uh, at first, it may seem like earth-shattering news to, uh, to most tennis fans, most Federer fans. I, I think this is a good sign that he... Definitely wants to keep trying to play. If he was, as many people have speculated, going to just you know take one last stab at Wimbledon and uh, play the Olympics and then retire this year, a lot of people were thinking that might happen. Why would he have this surgery right now if that was his plan? This tells me that uh, he, he wants to give himself the best chance at Wimbledon, and he might want to try it again next year as well. A, a lot of us did think, I'd say it was kind of split. A lot of people also thought you know next year will be the last year, but... This says to me that Federer is going to try to not only play next year, but maybe even go further. He has said he would like to play into his early 40s in the past. Maybe that is uh, really the case. This kind of indicates to me if he's going to take on uh, the surgery right now. Having your knee scoped like this is not uh, as serious as uh, surgery as he had in 2016. Uh, it is the opposite knee. Sometimes this kind of thing happens if you have a uh, surgery or a major injury on a left side of the, the left knee, left hip, left ankle. Your body will overcompensate on the right side over time, and then you can have a new injury. Maybe it's something to do with that. We don't know very much right now. Like I said, this news just broke around 6 in the morning. So I wanted to, uh, since I filmed this show yesterday evening, I wanted to uh, break in and let you guys know about the latest news with Roger Federer. I, I'm definitely disappointed. I think I'm still going to go to Miami, but I know a lot of people like me who are about to book a place to stay in Miami are, are thinking, uh, maybe I won't now. <laughs> but I, I think I will because, uh, as you will see in today's show, we talk a lot about the players who are playing right now in February, a lot of the, the next-gen type players. A lot of interesting players that we're going to talk about in today's show that I, I honestly have me more interested in tennis than than uh, than ever. Uh, without Federer, obviously, it's not the same, but they've definitely helped. They've helped. Uh, I'm watching a lot more matches than I used to when I was a uh, when I was a younger man, and mainly only focused on Federer. So I probably will go to Miami still, despite Federer not being there, to see some of this young talent get a get a look at uh, Novak Djokovic, of course. And uh, I'll let you go back to today's show. Sorry, Federer fans, but do not despair. 
the worst part of this news to me, because uh, it, it sounds like the surgery was fine, and again, having your knee scoped is not, uh, I mean, it's it's a serious operation, but it, it's not as serious as uh, the last surgery was. It's, it's definitely less serious. So, Roger said he's been dealing with it for a while. I want to talk about that really quick before we go, actually. Uh, th- that could answer some questions about maybe why, uh, you know, Federer was so good at Wimbledon last year. And then, you know, when did it start? Did it start in Cincinnati? Because uh, that would make sense. Cincinnati was really rough for Roger last year. And then, uh, of course, when he played at his home tournament in Switzerland last year, what was that, in October, Roger looked great there. But other than that, you know, in the fall and the the early winter, Roger didn't look uh, his best at times. You know, when he beat Djokovic, that was incredible. But then he had a very lackluster performance against Tsitsipas. So was the, when was the knee pain starting? He doesn't say it, but, you know, we're going to be uh, very curious about that. Uh, last thing on this really quick. The biggest problem is that Roger Federer is going to drop so many points, there is a good chance now, even with the the Wimbledon seeding process that they have that's unique to them, there is a serious chance that Roger will not, will not be a top four seed, even at Wimbledon. He's likely going to drop to as low as number eight in the world, and there is a good chance that he will not... Uh, not be top four at Wimbledon because, you know, it's they seed it based on your grass results from the last two years are weighted pretty heavily. And a lot of times, you know, it, let's say Roger is eight in the world, but his grass ranking at Wimbledon might still be four or three. Something like that is possible, but even that looks like it's in doubt. Uh, I, I guess uh, he's definitely going to have to uh, defend his title as soon as he comes back at uh, Halle. In Germany right before Wimbledon so it's a tough ask but if anyone can do it this is the guy he comes back from his last knee surgery a much more serious surgery a longer break wins the Australian Open so uh fingers crossed for the Federer fans out there I'll get you back to the show me and Peter Freeman are going to Florida I'm traveling today doing tennis clinics and uh we will tell you more about what's going on Monday I'll have Pete is a guest on the show too, and uh, we'll talk about Federer. I'm sure there'll be more news by then, and we'll uh, we'll talk about everything else going on in the world of tennis. All right, I'll I'll take you back to the show. But we see lots of young and fresh faces. We see some people like Stefanos Tsitsipas, a fresh face last year. Now he's defending a uh, a title in Marseille. We've got guys like Gael Monfils, guys who are more veterans of the sport who maybe don't find a a way to shine when they're having to play at the biggest tournaments with guys like Roger, Rafa, and Novak. But in a place like the ATP 500 Rotterdam, that's a great place for someone like a Gael Monfils and his uh, excellent skill set to truly shine. But to me, the most interesting thing going on thus far are three very young men. So young, they're younger than next gen. They're like their own gen and the things that they are doing in this month of February. That'll be the main focus of today's show. Today on the show, we go through the draws of the Open Sud du Franc in Montpellier. Uh, That already happened, of course. Gail Monfils won. Uh, We'll briefly talk about the New York Open, of course, Rotterdam. Then we'll move to tournaments that are currently ongoing, like Delray Beach. And then we'll talk about Marseille, Franck, Frankreich, where we eagerly await to see if Steph Tsitsipas can find his form. He's been struggling. We'll talk about that. Uh, We've got some news here. Magnus Norman, coach of Stanislaw the Menace, Law Vavrinkis Law, says that he wants to work with a younger player after Vavrinka. A delicious story. Have you seen this guy, Carlos Alcaraz from Alcatraz yet? Uh, Uh, This guy's a Spaniard. Rafa Nadal is his idol, but he truthfully, he says himself, plays more like Roger Federer. We'll talk about why that's the case and a few things I have observed with these super talented young guns. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about the guys who are playing on clay, but truthfully, this time of year, I don't pay as much attention to the clay tournaments because we're about to have the sunshine devil. So it's all about getting ready for the hard courts. Honestly, the guys who are playing on clay this time of year are the guys who've just been waiting for clay tournaments to come back for so long because that's their best chance to win. As I said before, the sport changes so drastically. Uh, Roger Federer has found a solution for climate change. So Greta Thunberg and the climate activists who uh, protested at Credit Suisse uh, have no fear. Roger Federer has actually found a possible solution. All that and even more on today's edition of Coffee Break Tennis. So... 
uh, maybe not the main focus, but the first thing I want to talk about are these three young men. Uh, Alcaraz, he's 16 years old. He just played his first tour match. Uh, you know what? Let's skip ahead to the stack because I, I know, talking about some 16-year-old that most of you have never heard of. And by the way, I had a warning from a friend, a tennis friend, fan, and friend of the show, Coffee Break Tennis, last year. He said, look out for this guy, Alcaraz. He's 15 years old, and you may want to talk about him. And I was planning on talking about him last year, but things came up. And, you know, he's playing in futures and challenger level, minor league level tournaments, not playing at the, the bigger tournaments, the ATP 250s, 500s, and up. So things came up, and we never got to it. But now he's played his first ATP, uh, what was it, at a, a 500. He's at an ATP 500 in uh, Brazil. And, yeah, let's just go straight to him. Let's pull him right out of the middle of the stack. Carlos Alcaraz. Rafa Nadal is my idol, but I like Roger Federer's aggression. And uh, this is a thing I've observed watching him. Watching, uh, I've been watching Yannick Sinner more and more lately. I'm really paying attention to him a lot. And of course, Felix Auger Aliassime. And those three guys, I'm very excited by these three guys. Yes, I still love Tsitsipas. He's, uh, he's had some struggles lately. Uh, this year hasn't been the best year yet, but he's shown enough of what we've seen in the past that makes him great. So I I'm not too worried about Sitsipas, but these guys are even younger. So the upside of this article I have here from TennisWorldUSA.org, written by Jovica Illich, uh, is about this Carlos Alcaraz, 16-year-old kid. Uh, last year, as a 15-year-old, he makes a little history. He joins a special list of guys like... Uh, Rafa Nadal, of course, and uh, Richard Gasquet, uh, Ryan Harrison, and uh, a couple others I can't think of. Guys who, as 15-year-olds, were able to beat top 200 ranked players in the world. Players who are in the top 200. So that's a big deal. But now he's made a bigger splash uh, over in Brazil on the clay at this ATP 500, where he beat Ramos Vinolas. You all know Albert Ramos Vinolas. The guy has uh, been around forever. He's a great player. He's a really good clay player. Beats him in almost a four-hour-long match, 7-6, 4-6, 7-6. This is a 16-year-old we were talking about. So I wanted to start the show talking about him, of course. And I wanted to talk about Yannick Sinner and uh, Felix Auger all day because uh, they're kind of a next-next-gen. Uh, obviously, Alcaraz is 16. Yannick Sinner is 18. Felix is 19. So we kind of have to separate them from uh, Medvedev, Zverev, Tsitsipas, guys like that. Watching these three young men play... And, uh, and uh, Yannick Sinner, we'll go through draws in a little bit briefly. Uh, we'll try to speed through them. Yannick Sinner, he lost a match. Uh, where was it? One of the uh, the first matches of February. One of the first tournaments. Yannick Sinner loses to Michael Emer. Emer's another young guy who's uh, somebody we should watch out for. But I think these three, a little bit, they have a little bit more going for them. Uh, Yannick Sinner did a lot of great stuff. Little tentative at the net. He's pretty good at the net, especially for his age. A little tentative at the net and missing a, a lot of backhands. Kind of inexplicable misses on the backhand side, uh, dictating play with the forehand. But the thing I notice about these three guys, Felix, Yannick Sinner, and uh, I'm doing that thing again, aren't I, where I say the whole name all the time. Felix and Sinner and then now Alcaraz, Carlos Alcaraz. The thing about these three guys is I'm seeing this interesting mix of a Federer forehand. Take a look. Here's a Felix Auger hitting, what, last year at Indian Wells with Grigor Dimitrov, another person who uh, has a forehand very similar to Roger Federer. And you can see Felix does the, um, some people call it the, the tabletop. I can't remember which tennis coach I heard that from, but it's like you're taking your racket and then you set it straight down, kind of flat. Notice Federer, and you can see it with Felix. They kind of set it down, same with Dimitrov across the net. And then they pull out of that and get into the wrist lag and then a little bit of a windshield wiper. And then the grip, the grip right here, it's flatter than what you see on the majority of the ATP tour. So you see Felix has that. Uh, Yannick Sinner, his is a little different, but it's still kind of close, and he can really dictate play and flatten out the forehand. And then this Alcaraz guy, take a listen to what he said. He said, I like to play very aggressively with a lot of winners, and he did. He hit, he hit over 50 winners in his four-hour, nearly four-hour match uh, where he wins over Ramos Vinolas, who was very angry. Could you imagine having to play a 16-year-old? <laughs> My idol is Rafa Nadal, but I play more or less like Federer, aggressively coming to the net and lots of drop shots. See, Alcaraz is obviously 16 years old because he doesn't remember that Roger Federer used to never hit drop shots. Federer, he used to say something like, uh, I don't think it's very respectful to the opponent. It's kind of a cheap trick to hit a drop shot. Roger, I don't know. He said something like that. Roger didn't think it was, he thought it was beneath 
his greatness, his game to resort to the drop shot, a cowardly tactic. But obviously, uh, Roger, ironically, on the clay was around the time that he started using it more and more. And it was really just something he wanted to add to the arsenal to have something he could throw at Rafa Nadal and try to break through and win that French Open. When I spend time with tennis greats like Rafa or Juan Carlos Ferrero, former world number one, who is the coach, a Spaniard coach of the young Alcaraz, or any other player, I usually don't say much. I listen to everything they say because it's precious to me. And each tournament I enter, I try to do my best. If that happens, then I will gradually go up. This guy sounds pretty well-rounded for a 16-year-old. Uh, there's a cool little profile picture, uh, a video of him on YouTube you can find. I believe it is uh, from ATPTour.com uh, or a uh, Tennis TV's account on YouTube. Uh, you can find it pretty easily if you if you look up his name and you can see a little bit about uh, you know what he's working on and what this guy is like. So I've noticed that. The three of them have very Federer-like forehands. Definitely this Alcaraz kid and uh, the way he... Take a look. I have a, a little uh, one shot I saved for you because we don't want to get in trouble with the ATP, but I want you to see this if you didn't. Thunderous. It makes it look easy at the moment, Alcaraz. That is a huge blow. He's got himself into position early. Beautiful extension. The way he's stepping in and uh, and using the similar grip and the similar motion, the stroke on the forehand, the way he steps in and takes that forehand so aggressively at 16 years old, that is an excellent sign. I, I'm also impressed by the guy. Uh, look at this. An incredible what he can do at zero feet and zero inches tall. And uh, I don't recall what it said, but what is he, like 147 pounds or something? This guy is going to hit the ball much, much bigger in the next few years. So watch out for Alcaraz. You've been warned. So uh, real quick, just to wrap up on those three, I've noticed that all three of them have a similar Federer forehand. And then I've noticed that all three of them have a, a backhand that kind of reminds me of Novak Djokovic. All three of them can be very aggressive off of both sides. You heard Federer say it himself uh, in an Australian Open press conference last month where he was saying, the, you know, what makes Felix special? Someone asked him that. And he said something like, well, one thing, you know, he hits the forehand and backhand off both sides just as hard. He can hurt you from anywhere in the court with either wing. And that's the thing we're seeing more and more. And we see it a lot with these three young guys. It's a phenomenal backhand he has. And the backhand. I see some Djokovic in their backhands, but mainly I see it in their, you know, sliding into a split and somehow hitting a winner off the two-hand backhand from way out of position. So stuff like that. Uh, I take note, and I just want to uh, get that out there, let everyone know. Watch out for Alcaraz, and maybe try to look at that when you see these three guys play. Look at look at the... It's it's interesting thing to see this now as uh, Roger and Novak are getting uh, older. Maybe they'll be gone in five years from now. Who knows? I think it's interesting to see their legacy uh, live on in these uh, teenagers, next-gen next, next gen guys uh, hitting those kind of shots that remind me so much of uh, the greats, Roger and Novak. All right, let's move on. I wanted to go over some of the stuff he's done. Just uh, let it be known that he, he's won a lot of matches in uh, the math in the uh, not the Masters. He hasn't played there yet. He's won a lot of matches, young Carlos Alcaraz in the uh, the minor leagues of tennis. And uh, I'll I'll actually I'll do you a big favor and I'll put a link to this article in the description below the video if you want to take the time to read it and learn more about young Carlos. All right, let's look at uh, the Sud du Franc, du Franc Reich in Montpellier. So Gael Monfils won here. What was noteworthy for me was one uh, El Chapo looked pretty bad losing to Vajic Pospisil. Speaking of uh, comebacks, uh, Pospisil had a surgery on his back on a her herniated disc. Usually when people have a back surgery, like a spine surgery like that, uh, you're done. You're done with tennis. So the fact that Pospisil is now winning, he's got some big wins. Uh, obviously, he beat El Chapo. Uh, that's pretty cool. He goes to the final here, loses to Gael Monfils, but it's a respectable match. Uh, that was my note noteworthy things here. Uh, Felix had a, a good win against Demir Zumer after losing the first set. Loses to Pierre Uc Herbert, who he will play tomorrow. So it'll be interesting to see. It was seven six seven five. Uh, Krajinovic looked pretty good to me, but fell to Monfils. I uh, can't think of anything interesting except uh, Dimitrov. Grigor Dimitrov and El Chapo had a very bad time in Montpellier, Frankreich. So then we go from there to where? Not the New York Open. We won't talk about that yet. Although I will say, another person to watch out for, be aware of Ugo Umber. That rhymed. Be aware, Ugo Umber. He's very good. And uh, to me, Ugo Umber, I've been enjoying watching him. 
So I'll talk about, I watched the New York Open more than ever to see uh, him. Kyle Edmund, another story of someone who's been struggling and coming back, having a great result here. That was another good story. Ketsmanovic, the, the Serbian guy, he looked pretty good to me. He actually took out Ugo and Bear. But Ugo and Bear, to me, is kind of like El Chapo with less firepower and like a higher tennis IQ, better hands at the net, uh, a better rally ball, better tolerance for the rally, shot tolerance, as uh, everyone was saying last year. So watch out for Ugo Umber. Uh, I think he is playing in Delray Beach right now. Yes, he plays Ketsmanovic again, a rematch of that. So watch out for those rematches. We go to Rotterdam, a great tournament, uh, ATP 500. I enjoy watching this tournament every year. Gael Monfils had to defend serious points. He stated his goal is to make it to the top five. I think it's possible. I think he can do it. And uh, he had to win here again, and he did. So great news there for Monfils. Felix Auger was the story of the tournament aside from Monfils. Uh, Felix has some points to defend coming up very soon in Miami, so this was nice. Uh, I'm not sure what he did, if he even played at Rotterdam last year. I, I don't think so because he picked up a lot of points here, making it to the final. Uh, losing 6-2, 6-4 to Monfils. Monfils was very good. Uh, Felix just missing a lot of shots. Uh, the, the game can break down. Felix... We see a lot of forehand winners. You can really dictate play with that Federer-like forehand. And uh, take a look at this. You know, one way you know that your forehand is similar to Roger Federer is when you produce shanks like these. I'll ask a few more questions now. Only Roger Federer and Felix Auger can shank a forehand like that. Maybe Carlos Alcaraz, too. Uh, Yannick Sinner goes down to Pablo Correa Busta, who deserves it because he's uh, had a good result here, too, although he lost to Felix. He beats Roberto Batista Agut, so that's a good win for Correa Busta. Uh, Sinner lost to Busta. Mm -mm -mm, there was something else interesting. Andre Rublev, Mr. Rubles. Uh, Rublev, uh, he lost to Krajinovic. I watched that match. I'm trying to think of uh, my noteworthy takeaway from there. I would have to say people are figuring out what to do with him. The second serve, very attackable, and if the forehand is not working, there's there's not a much there's not much more that Rublev can do if the forehand breaks down. Uh, it's funny. I think I saw in Rublev's box at the Australian Open, oh, what was this guy's name? There was a guy, Igor Andreev, I think is his name, a Russian guy. He played back in the years where Roger Federer won the U.S. Open every single year. Remember those? Remember those good times? Uh, I remember Igor Andreev. This is a little bit. Like uh, Andre Rublev, in that uh, his game was all centered around this massive forehand. He hit this huge forehand, and when the forehand breaks down, everything else is just nowhere near that level, and he's in big trouble. So I, I think Rublev is uh, can be better than Andreev for sure. But uh, yeah, he's got some work cut out for him. And if the forehand isn't super hot, people people know what to do, especially with that second serve and the movement. So uh, let's talk about Sitsipas really quick. I crumpled up the Rotterdam draw, but I remember what happened to him pretty well. So he gets a win uh, over Hubi Hercatch. And in, in that match, I was concerned for Steph Sitsipas. And uh, you know, I was starting to think, this is uh, looking like a problem for Sitsipas because it looks like he's missing out on confidence. Uh, he, he's lost the confidence in his game. He hasn't had the start to the year he wanted after the incredible finish. And I'm sure, I don't know, comment below, what do you think? Is he thinking about the curse of winning the ATP finals? Is that possible? The WTF World Tour finals, as they used to call it. Uh, I wonder, hopefully he's not thinking about that, but he's struggling with his confidence and he has this win over Hubie Hercatch. And her catch kind of falls apart. Her catch wins the first set and a tie break, I believe. And I think Steph even, uh, did he break and serve for the first set? I can't remember. It was a while ago. It was the beginning of Rotterdam. But he wins the match. Yet I'm seeing some of the shot making uh, selection on the forehand and backhand. Uh, he's still serving great. But some of the shots that when he goes for it, when he doesn't go for it, he misses. He gets nervous. He's lucky that her catch kind of fell apart for him. That got him through. Then he plays Bedene. Uh, we all know Aljaz Bedene. Uh, Bedene is just a very solid player on the ATP Tour. He's uh, pretty good at everything, but not excellent at anything, you know, as we hear so often about guys who kind of float in the top 50, top 100 for most of their career, but never can break into the top 10 or top 20 even. So uh, Bedene was able to take Sitsipas out because he didn't miss. And Sitsipas, you know, with Hubi Hercatch, Hercatch is going to go for shots like Sitsipas. If Hercatch starts missing, Sitsipas can just kind of play it safe and feel a little safer in that, in knowing that we're going to get some mistakes out of Hubi Hercatch. With Bedene, 
you're going to have to make things happen. And Tsitsipas was not able to do so. So today he comes back. We saw him play. Uh, we'll look at Delray. Uh, I don't have too much to say about New York Open other than uh, I like Ugo Umber a lot. And uh, Ketsmanovic is very impressive. He's a little shorter. He, he's built like a beast in his legs. If Ugo Umber fills out his legs and his hips like Ketsmanovic, uh, I think Ketsmanovic doesn't beat Ugo Umber anymore. Although, don't, don't take away anything from the, the young Miomar Ketsmanovic. Uh, uh, Kyle Edmund looked good. Rilo Pelka lost him with the New York Fashion Week and took this horrible photo and this, this outfit. <laughs> Stevie Johnson, uh, his woes continue, but he beat Tennis Sandgren. Good win. Tennis Sandgren is not in Delray Beach because of uh, knee pain, which we'll talk about Dominic Team's knee pain in a little bit. So Sitsipas goes to Marseille where he is defending champion, and he beats Michael Emer today. And this match with Michael Emer, a lot of stuff helped Sitsipas out. He looks better, but he still looks a little mentally fragile to me. He's not trusting his forehand and his back, and he's serving great. Uh, he's going to the net and finishing points, but forehand and backhand, it's like when to go for the shot. He's having bad misses, the kind of misses where uh, you get a little tension in the wrist, you open up the racket face at contact just a little, and you float balls out. And, and I'm a little worried for him because next up, He's going to have to play Vazic Pospisil, the Canadian who has a back surgery, who is now playing great, has a win over Medvedev, uh, just lost in a final to Gael Monfils, the one before Rotterdam. And to me, with the power of the serve of Pospisil and the fact that he can come to the net and finish points quickly, and he can do damage off the ground, forehand and backhand, uh, I'm a little worried for Tsitsipas. I believe he can step it up. So watch out. That match will be tomorrow. A little bit of an upset alert on that one. Uh, Michael Emer, you know, he gave... Tsitsipas looked very tentative to me. There was one point in particular I remember where Emer was way out of position. And Tsitsipas has... Uh, you know, it's one thing when you have an opening on the backhand up the line. If you have a chance to hit a winner on the backhand up the line, you got to be feeling pretty good to, uh, to just let it go and pull the trigger on the backhand up the line. But... This point, I'm thinking of in particular, Emer was out of position and the cross-court backhand was wide open. Uh, typically, on a shot like this, it's pretty easy to hit that ball aggressively, but with enough spin, so there's plenty of margin for error. It's a safe winner, and, and Tsitsipas, I don't even remember what he hit. I just remember the way he hit it. I thought, yeah, that's a guy who's not really feeling it. Now, Tsitsipas had some winners on the backhand. He had some nice backhands up the line. He had some bad misses. Michael Emer was able to give Tsitsipas the belief because Emer, he played pretty bad in the first set. And then in the second set, Emer gives the break to Tsitsipas with a double fault on break point. Just not a good game, and it wasn't like Tsitsipas did anything spectacular to get it. But hey, a win is a win. I give Tsitsipas a chance to go up against Pospisil and find his best stuff, but a little bit of an upset alert there. Oh, did I totally not talk about Dimitrov and Shapovalov playing each other? Uh, we're running out of time, so I'm not even going to get into that. But two guys who had a horrible start to February, they had to play at the next tournament up in Rotterdam. And uh, Dimitrov wins that match. Chapeau, uh, not in a great place. Like I said, Ugo Umber, uh, I'd put my money on him right now. In fact, Ugo Umber did beat Shapovalov uh, earlier this year. Where was it? In New Zealand, I think, right before the Australian Open. Uh, Shapo will play Chilich. Uh, Chilich is trying to find his uh, best tennis, but I think Chilich should be able to beat Chapo. The bad luck continues. Uh, Felix Herbert, we talked about that a little bit. Uh, Felix got a path to make another final here. Impressive win from Felix today because the guy had to have been pretty tired, having just gone all the way to the final and then having to come here, not having a bye, playing in the first round. Uh, 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 what else do we got? Medvedev, Yannick, Sinner. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That is a match you must watch tomorrow. And of course, as you watch Yannick Sinner, look at that Federer like forehand and some of that Joker-like athleticism with the two-hand backhand. Uh, over at Delray Beach, what do we got for you? Jack Sock. This is the story. Uh, Ugo Umber and Ketsmanovic, that's interesting. Uh, Kyrgios pulled out with a, a left wrist injury, but he says other than that, he's fine. He should be uh, back in action soon enough. So no Kyrgios here. That's uh, unfortunate for us tennis fans. Uh, Riley Opelka, Milos Raonic, uh, Kwan. This Quantron guy is uh, the number one Korean player now. Uh, very Another player, watch out for him. I don't know if he's going to win a major, but very uh, young and talented Quan. Uh, the big story here is Jack Sock with a win over Radu Albot. 3-6, 6-3, 7-6. Plays Stevie Johnson next, which is a match he should be able to win. 
Jack Sock has been playing on wild cards, hasn't won an ATP singles match in like two years almost. And uh, what a story it is for Jack Sock. Take a look. After winning this match, he breaks down, he cries, and he actually says that he was actually close to retiring from the sport all together. How amazing is that? So let, let's hope for the best for Jack Sock. Um, we're running out of time. Let's get into Dominic team really quick. He dropped a set. Uh, he will play Jauma Munara, who's good on clay, next, and uh, that could be tricky. He experienced knee pain for the first time in his life, and that is a scary thing as a tennis player. If your knees are hurting, it destroys your entire game. You can't push off and hit your serve as hard. Uh, you can't load up. You can't move as well to defend. You can't load up to attack with your ground strokes. You can't do much when your knees are messed up. It looks like it's kind of a fluke. These things do come and go sometimes, so hopefully Dominic team will be all right. But that was the story there. And we don't have much more time, so let me read oh, Kim Kleisters. I really wanted to talk about K K Kim Kleisters today. Just know this, Kim Kleisters took it to Mugalutha, the Australian Open finalist. And uh, it actually looks like Kim Kleisters coming back, what has it been, 10 years since she played on the Pro Tour? Uh, Kim Kleisters looks to me like she's got enough to, to be a pretty good player on the WT, WTA Tour. I don't know if she's going to win a major. I don't think she is, but that's not why she's playing. I think she will have some big wins, maybe some big upsets down the road. It'll be interesting to see Kim Kleisters, especially the state of women's tennis, where there's really no clear leaders. All right, two things, and then we'll get out of here. Magnus Norman wants to work with a younger player after Vavrinka. Uh, I thought this was an interesting, very candid interview from a 43-year-old Swedish coach, Magnus uh, Norman, who's done so much for Stan Vavrinka. They've been working together for freaking almost 10 years. Uh, he said, I've been with Stan for seven years now, and we're like a marriage that is more than used to living with each other. Challenge becomes harder every day because Stan gets older, and the young people start to get better every day. How true this is. When my work ends with him, I would be motivated to lead one of this generation who's very strong. Kyrgios, Zverev, Michael Emer, Michael Moe, Borna Chorch. Uh, this is a very entertaining time in tennis, and he didn't even name a, a few of the other guys. There's a lot of young talent right now. It was very difficult when we started working together, talking about Stan. The goal was never to win a slam, but to get him to play his best and to get to the necessary confidence to be able to contain his emotions. Thus, every second week of the big tournaments, it would come with chances of doing something important. And uh, he talks about how Stan is basically the most important tennis player outside of the big three, and, and after Andy Murray... Next comes Stan. I think that is true for the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, 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 um. All right, that's about it from there. Let's go on to, uh, I, I will say one thing about mental toughness because it's so true in this sport. It's really what makes the difference between uh, like top 10 and top 100. Steph Tsitsipas seems pretty mentally tough to me, so I still believe in him finding it, even though he's in a moment of weakness right now. So make sure you watch his match tomorrow and see what happens with Pop Popsicle. Felix Auger's win today. Took a lot of mental toughness. Uh, that was a big deal. He should have won the first set. He lost the first set. He's able to win in three. Uh, this Alcaraz guy, to come out and play the way he did for so long, and the most impressive thing for me with Alcaraz was, even though he's uh, like underweight, not producing the kind of power that he will one day yet, every time he had a break point, he came up, when he had to hit second serves, he pretty much always came up with a great second serve. There was a bad moment where he double faulted. It goes down a break in the final set. I think it was, if I remember correctly. But he comes back against a veteran of the sport. So uh, a lot of mental toughness there. Obviously, it's too early to say anything definitive with him. Definitive with him. Uh, Yannick Sinner, another guy who looks pretty tough to me. And uh, this is a very interesting time in tennis. You know, I thought when Federer retired, I would retire from doing coffee break tennis. But I got to say, I'm, I'm more interested than ever in the sport. Hit the music. Last thing. Roger Federer promotes a cure for air pollution after the credit Swiss criticism. Uh, after being involved in the Credit Suisse scandal, reflecting accusations from climate change activists around the world, including Greta Thunberg, Roger Federer has proven once again his care for the world we live in. Oh, we didn't even talk about Djokovic's dad saying Roger Federer lacks humanity. Uh, we'll be back on Monday and talk about this, but take a listen to this really quick. Roger has partnered with Pascal Pianar, who's in South Africa, where Roger just was for, oh, we didn't even talk about the match for Africa. Jeez, I'm letting the whole, pe the whole world of tennis down. Business owner and climate activist to promote a plant known as the Portolucaria afra, or also known as elephant food, pork bush, or speck boom. Okay, so uh, the skinny on this is this succulent plant grows in Sud Africa and can absorb 10 times more pollution than any other plant in the world. It can 
absorb all that, all those carbon emissions right out of the air. And guess what Roger Federer's doing? What is Roger doing? He's helping this young lady. Take a look. God, Roger looks so handsome. And Uniqlo, why don't you sell those shirts? I wish I could buy that shirt. Uh, he's helping her plant these spec booms all around the world to suck the carbon emissions. So there you go. The climate activists who did nothing at Credit Suisse except uh, make a bunch of commotion and get in trouble while offering no reasonable solutions. Greta Thunberg, throw her in there as well. She's got nothing. We're not going to get rid of gasoline and end uh, air travel around the world, but we might be able to plant spec booms around the world like Roger Federer. Thanks, Roger, for saving the world yet again. I'll be back Monday, and we'll talk more about what is going on in the tennis world, Roger Federer's draw in Dubai, and of course, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what me and Peter Freeman are doing. We're going to be doing some serious tennis clinics in South Florida. I leave tomorrow. See you on Monday. See you.